to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum Zoom series, Trolleyology. My name is Kristen Fredrickson. I am the Assistant Manager of Visitor Experience here at the museum. Thank you again for joining us today and welcome back to all the familiar names and faces that I see here. Um, the virtual series we're doing tonight features programs on Pennsylvania transit history topics and stories of the trolley era or trolleys in our collection that you can experience from the comfort of your home. We plan to continue these programs regularly. So if you have a program that fits the museum mission, please let me know. So um, we've got a presenter in uh, early next year, but other than that, 2023 is wide open. So if you have something to share, please let me know. Um, cities where our streetcars come from, trolley era. If you have a program that doesn't quite fit those lines, uh, go ahead and reach out anyway, because occasionally we will feature those programs as well. You can see the full list of upcoming programs once we have those at our website, patrolley.org, which I'll put in the chat box in a few minutes. And I wanna extend a very, very special thank you to those of you who donated when registering for tonight's program and those who have made donations throughout the year on our website. We really appreciate your support of our virtual outreach programs. And as I mentioned, this is our last program of the year. And I know some of you made year-end donations when registering and we are so grateful for your support. Um, this is our most successful trolleyology ever when it comes to uh, donations. So thank you very much. So um, for those of you who might be new to the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum, we were established in 1954 as the Arden Electric Railway by a group of trolley enthusiasts called the Pittsburgh Electric Railway Club. And we opened a few years later in 1963 and are located along the former trolley route between Pittsburgh and Washington, PA. You'll find almost 50 trolleys and electric railway cars in our collection, about 20 of them operate and about 30,000 visitors per year take the four mile scenic ride here at the museum. Um, and I did wanna update everybody on our new Welcome and Education Center progress. We have uh, walls going up now, which is very, very exciting. Um, it, there's actually even more progress than is in these photos. These are from the last couple of weeks. Um, you can always check out our website to learn more about our capital campaign or to make a donation. And uh, we have released our 2023 single page calendar, which we're going to make available on our website shortly. Um, the photo on the left is what's featured on the calendar this year. You can see the brick paving on Trolley Street, um, soon to be called Volunteer Boulevard, is finished. And uh, on the right, Actually, this is from a few days ago. The gazebo is much more finished than this, the Christopher Kolofsky Memorial Gazebo. So um, that's what's going on here at the museum. It's cold, but we're still working. <laughs> and now I would like to introduce today's presenters, Matt Non and Harry Donahue. Matt is employed full-time as a professional engineer and program manager in the public transit industry and has been active with museums and historical organizations for more than 30 years. Along with his full-time work in the transit industry, Matt currently serves as the Director of Development for the Baltimore Streetcar Museum, is a trustee of the National Capital Trolley Museum, and is a director of the Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys. And joining Matt, we have Harry Donahue. Harry is a retired professional educator and former bus driver and dispatcher. Harry has been involved with trolley museums for a number of years and is also a co-founder and director of the Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys. Harry is a regular volunteer at Baltimore Streetcar Museum and particularly enjoys maintaining and operating former PTC SEPTA PCC car 2168, his favorite trolley car. And uh, that's a very, very recent photo. So um, welcome to Matt and Harry. Just a note, this program is being recorded and will be shared on our YouTube uh, sometime early next year. I'm behind on uh, putting some of our trolley trolleyologies on YouTube, uh, but we do have the Wexford program uh, or the Butler, Pittsburgh Harmony Butler Newcastle program on our YouTube, and I'll get the other ones on there um, probably early, early next year. So um, again, everybody is muted for now. I'll invite you to unmute yourselves at the end for a question and answer session with our presenters, but the chat box will be open. So feel free to enter questions and comments during the show, and we can read through those um, at the end. 
Uh, please, at this time, turn off your videos during the presentation so we can minimize distractions and interruptions. And I will invite everybody to turn those on at the end as well. All right, uh, Matt and Harry, I think we're ready. You guys can take it away. All right, Kristen, we're going to bring up our screen share here and uh, get the program started. All right. Well, good evening, everyone. I'm Matt, and I'm joined here with Harry. Uh, we are both together. Uh, Harry had some computer problems, so we're doing this both uh, from the same machine. Hopefully, you can hear us okay. Uh, as we go through, as Kristen said, we will try to keep up with the chat. Some of that uh, may need to wait till afterwards, but we will do what we can. Um, but as we start, I really want to thank everyone. I mean, it's been great to see the numbers for this show. And uh, we're really, we had a lot of fun putting this together. Uh, Harry and I started on this back in what, July, July, I think, Harry, yeah. collecting material. And to be fair, it's a combination of efforts from a lot of people who, towards the end, we're going to thank some key people who helped with this. So again, welcome. Thank you, Kristen, for the great graphics. The program tonight, the following is our overview. We're going to talk about, and we say before the subway, the genesis. Why does Philadelphia have the subway surface system? It's construction, it's early operations through the present day. We're going to take a brief look at each of the routes in the subway, both those current and in the past. We're going to talk in general about the rolling stock, trolley cars or street cars have been used in the subway surface. Briefly talk about the future and at least some of the plans for modernizing the trolley system in Philadelphia. And finally, some acknowledgments for some people who are really key contributors and made this a success. So I did want to open, and Harry and I both want to mention that this is the general historical overview. Uh, considering the system opened 117 years ago tomorrow, it's impossible for us in this little presentation to cover every historical fact in detail. We're trying to present this for a broad audience. Some here are from the transit industry. Some of you are diehard trolley enthusiasts. Some of you enjoy history. We're trying to hopefully not lose any audience with this presentation. Um, so there will be some things we can talk about in general terms. I'm sure in the chat later, uh, we can talk about more specifics. So I just wanted to offer that going in. It's as comprehensive as we can make it and still get everyone out of here this evening. So the story of the subway surface in Philadelphia really starts with the origin of street railway transportation in Philadelphia. Philadelphia's street railway era began with the opening of the first horse car line in January of 1858. Uh, an act of the city of Philadelphia assembly in 1857 is what led to the unique track gauge in Philadelphia. Uh, despite the early growth, you know, which was common with other municipalities with horse cars, uh, it was very common that these systems rapidly grew, but they proved their shortcomings uh, between the need for care and feed of the horses, the working life of a horse, disposing of the byproducts, etc. Uh, something better was needed than horse-drawn transportation. Uh, steam dummies were tried in Philadelphia. Philadelphia also had its fling with the cable cars and the cable railways. Uh, all proved to be limited. The first real success was the opening of the first streetcar line, the Catherine and Bainbridge Streets route on December 15th in 1892. This is a scene here of an early Philadelphia horse car, state-of-the-art transportation in the 1850s, but again, quickly proved its shortcomings. The first truly successful form of street railway transportation in Philadelphia was the electric car. This is the Brill Builders photo of one of the Catherine and Bainbridge cars. The electric trolley quickly proved to be a superior method. And in less than five years, Philadelphia's last horse car line operated, ironically, on Cala Hill Street, uh, which today, you know, portions of Cala Hill are still served by a streetcar line. The Philadelphia Rapid Transit Company was formed in 1902 and it consolidated the early operators. Like many systems, there were a number of smaller entities. PRT eventually bought them all out. It was saddled, of course, with the financial burden of providing return for the underlying companies. But it enabled the system within the city limits and in portions of Delaware County, as well as other counties, to be operated by the same entity. The trolleys era grew in Philadelphia. The peak came in 1911 
when there were 3,399 trolley cars of all types, including work equipment, 678 track miles and 86 individual routes. But the growth was not without its challenges. Uh, Philadelphia, the infrastructure and the layout of you know, the term we use today, the Central Business District, led to congestion. A couple of reasons. Market Street was, from the earliest colonial days through today, the primary east-west thoroughfare, particularly between the Schuylkill and the Delaware Rivers. Early on, everything west of the Schuylkill River was the borough of West Philadelphia, later absorbed by the city itself. Um, but to give you an idea of the, the challenges, in 1905, 391 trolley cars on average passed through the intersection of 8th and Market Streets in a one hour period between 5 to 6 p.m., which meant a car every nine seconds. Something more efficient was absolutely necessary. This type of congestion was just not tolerable. To give you an illustration of that, this is actually a scene that's downloadable from the Library of Congress. It's taken in the 700 block of Market Street in 1897. Uh, gives you an idea of the traffic congestion at that time. Uh, obviously, maintaining any sort of a consistent schedule uh, with this much street traffic is just simply impossible. So what was the solution? A subway under Market Street. Uh, the first, the construction of the system was authorized by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania in 1901. The subway design was to be four tracks from 30th Street to 15th Streets, with the outer two tracks used by the trolley cars. Now, the width of Market Street, Market Street itself at this era and to, through the present day narrows east of City Hall, meaning that constructing a four track subway directly underneath Market Street from City Hall to the Delaware River would have essentially been impossible. Therefore, the trolley portion of the subway was never intended to run the entire length to the Delaware River, unlike what was used by the rapid transit trains, the elevated trains. Although construction started early, it took several years. It was complicated. Parts of Market Street needed to be raised. The original tunneling method was cut and cover, which means basically you dug a trench, you excavate it, you plywooded over it, you dug, and then you reconstructed the street. The subway first opened December 15, 1905. The first use in the subway was by trolley cars. Um, the initial operation was a whopping single route, what was the Market and 63rd and Vine Streets route, which later became Route 31. And as we're gonna talk about in a few moments, the original stub end terminal of the subway, it did not have a loop, was at 15th Street. These are, this is a conceptual view of the Market Street Bridge. Uh, this is from Joe Bosch's collection. You can see the rapid transit trains or the elevated trains uh, towards the center, sharing a bridge, the center portions of the bridge over Market Street um, with the streetcars. The streetcars are also running on Market Street. That's the B&O Railroad below you on the right. The Pennsylvania, um, basically on the left, uh, the future 30th Street Station would be built there. We'll talk about in a moment. Um, this is the final construction was not exactly like this concept, but it gives you an idea what was at least initially planned. This is what the Market Street Bridge for the rapid transit trains and the trolleys you can see uh, to the left on this bridge looked like there is still surface traffic on Market Street. You can see City Hall in the background. This photo dates from 1906. This is from the Street Railway Journal looking east from 19th Street. What is interesting about this photo, among other things, is if you look up towards the ceiling, you'll see hangars. And the hangars are over the center tracks, which were the rapid transit tracks. That's because when the subway first opened, the trolleys used what would later be the rapid transit tracks in the middle for the initial operation, hence why there are hangars from the overhead and on the far sides, you can see what would be later used for the trolley cars on the outer tracks. Again, this is looking east from 19th Street. This is the South 19th Street Station as it looked in 1907. Very ornate. The SEPTA has tried to maintain the character of this station with the tile and some of the arch architectural features to the present day. Uh, Harry pointed out, if you look closely, uh, above the stairs, you, you have to love the dress of the, uh, the waiting passenger or person who just happened to be in the photo when it was taken. 
This is another view looking at the Market Street Bridge. You're looking um, in this scene, um, you're looking west. You can see the Angora car that today is Route 34. We're going to talk about the history of the routes as we go through. Uh, it's a Philadelphia, what was called a Philadelphia standard car, which was the initial trolley equipment used in the subway. Uh, this particular view is from 1907. Note the dash sign telling you it's a subway car. So, whoops, I jumped ahead. Let me flip back. So, uh, like any great project, uh, typically what's planned versus what was actually constructed uh, is not the same. It was also revised. So the original terminal at 15th Street for the trolley cars was temporary. It was really less than ideal. We have some diagrams in the next couple slides to show what these various terminals looked like. First of all, it was stub-ended, which became a problem. Each car, of course, had to change ends, proceed through the switch, and head back west. Uh, one of the challenges was the equipment used only had one pole, which had to be swung, which was extremely difficult in the tight confines of the stub-end terminal. Uh, but at least system open. And Harold Cox, in an article he wrote for Modern Tramway in 1963, uh, talked about one of the goals was to get the line open even with one route prior to the Christmas holiday. The future rapid transit tracks, as I mentioned, were used. In March of 1902, there was a second terminal constructed. This also was temporary. This had an extremely tight radius loop. It was roughly 25 foot uh, radius curve, which if you're familiar with street railway standards and construction uh, is extraordinarily tight. It also crossed the rapid transit tracks at grade. Um, the loop around City Hall that most of us know well today, terminating at Juniper Street, opened in 1908. The original plans for the subway included a trolley loop that was that turned, went down to Walnut Street, proceeded east to Fifth, up to Arch, back down towards City Hall. Those plans were shelved, and the, that terminal was never constructed. And then the loop around City Hall was reconstructed several times over the years, and we're going to show some of those reconfigurations in a moment. So this is a series of drawings, actually, Ed Scutus, who we acknowledge towards the end, uh, heard about the program and reached out to me. These are drawings from the late Jack Force uh, that attempt to show what the various configurations look like. Uh, I credit Ed, these are great. Hopefully that they're, they're showing well enough on the screen. Uh, first at the top, you can see the original 1905 terminal, uh, stub ended at 15th Street, east of 19th, using the rapid transit track. Uh, March of 07, you can see where the rapid transit tracks are in place to 15th, and there's the extremely tight curve I talked about crossing the trackway at grade the trackway, not necessarily the, you know, in actual operation with the rapid transit trains, but the trackway for the, uh, for the L trains. 1908, you can see Juniper Station, and the original configuration of the loop is opened. Further in 1908, you can see the original configuration of the rapid transit tracks in the inside around City Hall. The original uh, configuration had the rapid transit trains basically uh, going around City Hall Tower. There's concerns about undermining the tower, hence this configuration. You'll also notice that they essentially fly over Juniper Street on a separate alignment. In nine, starting in 19, early 1936, uh, completed in May 11th of 1936, you can see how the rapid transit tracks, one at a time, eastbound first and then westbound, were reconfigured to run under City Hall Tower directly. Um, then various times, you can see here in the 1970s, the loop itself for the trolleys was slightly modified, in some cases, using portions of the right-of-way in a few minor areas of the original rapid transit loop. And the trolleys today actually use what was the rapid transit loop. Right. And if you ride the cars today and look out as they go around, you can see the empty right-of-way. Uh, they're still there. It's all still there under City Hall. So this is a shot of that really, that extremely tight turning loop that was temporary we talked about. You can see here how it crosses the trackway uh, for the rapid transit trains. Again, this was also just temporary prior to the opening of Juniper Street. So once Juniper Street was constructed, um, other than the rerouting under or 
directly under City Hall Tower for the rapid transit trains. Um, things remained the same for a while. Uh, some changes came around 1930, coincidental with the construction of 30th Street Station. Um, 30th Street Station work uh, required a new Market Street bridge. Uh, most portions of Market Street had to be raised. Uh, at the same time, the city of Philadelphia commenced construction of subway extensions to the west, uh, where the subway would extend under the Schuylkill River. The older bridge would be eliminated. Again, some of the elevated structure would be eliminated. And as we'll talk about in a moment, it also was part of a program that eventually got the first got the car tracks and then later the streets, many of the streets removed from Penn's campus. Um, two sections of the tunnel were constructed uh, between 24th and 32nd, but due to the depression and then the onset of World War II, construction ceased. So the subway plans were revised in 1947. The plan was brought back, brought back to life. And the plan included two new subway portals for the trolley cars, one at 36th and Ludlow for the Route 10 and the other at 40th Street. And as I mentioned, this supported a plan to remove the tracks and portions of some entire streets from Penn's campus. Uh, that was also coordinated with a city urban renewal project at that time that, that drastically changed the neighborhoods around the University of Pennsylvania. Uh, there was an interesting article, the Philadelphia Inquirer quite recently on uh, that urban renewal project and some of the challenges that came. Yes, back in that time, there was very heavy streetcar traffic. On the oh, Matt, sorry. Could you angle the the mic towards okay. Mary? How's this, Kristen? Good. Okay. Back in those days when they were in the 40s and early 50s, there was very, very heavy trolley traffic through the Penn campus. If you stood at the corner of where 37th, Woodland, and Spruce all intersected, if you were a photographer, there were six trolley lines at that intersection. Six. So they wanted to get all these trolley, all this trolley traffic uh, away from the Penn campus. And the subway under Woodland Avenue would solve this problem. All right. So uh, along with this project, the subway extensions opened first for eastbound cars in October of 1955, and then for westbound cars on November 7th, 1955. This also coincided with changes to the routes serving the subway, which were made in this period. And we're gonna talk about those changes a little bit later and with more specifics about the individual routes. So let's look at some of these changes in photographs. First, this is a uh, photograph taken outside 30th Street Station. Uh, I know it, it's interesting, Philadelphia calls them trolley cars, some cases street cars. Uh, you can see street cars to West Philadelphia. The routes at that time, 10, 11, 31, 34, 37, and 38. This is a map drawn by the late Harold Cox showing the various routes in Philadelphia throughout their history. Uh, again, Harry and I are gonna talk more about the routes in greater detail, but you can see here some of the routes and you know the subsequent changes made to them. You can also see if you look on the right of the screen where my cursor is, uh, you can see the reroutings done to accommodate the subway construction as it progressed. There's a shot here of a 10 car near 30th Street. Uh, you can see the elevator in the background. You can see how low the clearance had gotten on Market Street with the raising of Market Street during uh, the subsequent construction projects. This is a PTC News article. Joe Basha provided this to us showing the planned, uh, you gotta love it, Market Street high speed and surface car subway extensions. Uh, showing where for at that time, routes 11, 34, and 37, what the new subway configuration would look like. Then you have looking here, uh, this talks about the rerouting during the reconstruction with a little diagram of that. You can see the new route of the subway serving these routes. Um, on the right, notice there are some routes which are not in the subway and it shows how they are affected, namely the 13, and the 42, as we'll talk about in a moment, the 13 eventually did go into the subway as well. As part of this project, the 24th Street Station 
was removed. Uh, this, is, this was part of the uh, early construction that was later replaced with the tunnel. And major improvements in high-speed transit will soon be ready to serve you. Uh, you can see here, this is a promotional flyer, but Joe Bosch and Harry provided this for the presentation. Um, as, was, as we mentioned, this was done in phases. The, uh, the eastbound streetcars, trolley cars, they used the new tunnel starting October 17th. The Market Street Elevated started using its new tunnel at 46th and Market on October 31st, and then the westbound cars on November 7th. Now, before final completion, those you saw in the diagrams a, a few slides ago, there were associated detours. That's why you see a Route 34 car on the surface in places you wouldn't normally see a 34 car, including a 34 car instead of under City Hall, but on the surface. And I'm going to give the mic to Harry and let Harry talk about this a little bit. Right. On the weekends, on the weekends when they were uh, opening the new subway tunnels for the trolleys, uh, they had to reroute the subway surface lines onto Market Street. Luckily, they still had all the tracks on Market Street from 30th Street on into City Hall. And uh, there was still a loop completely around City Hall. So the late Ernie Moser uh, actually operated during this time. And he said they kept dispatchers at City Hall uh, to dispatch the cars. When they'd reach City Hall, they'd empty out. And then the dispatcher would keep everything moving. Uh, this was not uh, super heavy because it was Saturday and Sunday. Uh, and uh, they did this for, uh, I believe they did it for three weekends when, uh, uh, in November of uh, 1955. Thanks, Harry. And you can see here in the photos, Harry mentioned that is a PTC supervisor um, talking to the operator. And again, Ernie Moser, as Harry mentioned, took these photos. A lot of the really high resolution photos from the 40s, 50s, and 60s were from Ernie. And we're going to uh, have a little mention of Ernie towards the end. So this was the roots, how it looked at the time SEPTA took over from PTC, you can see here, um, it's interesting to note, uh, they're colored purple. Uh, later, the subway surface lines were called the green lines. SEPTA doesn't use that term much anymore, although they still use green coloring for the trolley lines on their maps. Whoops, uh-oh. All right, and Harry is going to mention another. Harry's going to pull up something else for us here. Right. One of the original subway surface routes was Route 38, which ran from Parkside uh, down into the subway. <clears throat> it came down 33rd Street to market, and uh, they the only way they could have gotten it into the tunnel, it would have had to backtrack three or four blocks to get to the 36th Street portal. So rather than do that, they, they turned it into a bus route. But that was one of the original subway surface lines. So that went bus uh, when the new subway terminals opened. And we have a couple shots of 30, Route 38. We're going to show you in a moment. By the early 1970s, the, the system was starting to show its age. You can see here, this is a shot at Juniper Street Station, late 1960s, early 1970s. You can see the general rundown condition. Uh, coincidentally, though, this was a time that several of the subway stations, you see the notation on the right, about 15th Street and City Hall West, uh, the reconstruction of that. Today, 13th Street has come a long way. You can see a, a modern day view of 13th Street Station, much better lighting, uh, some new graphics. Uh, thank you, Bill Monahan, for providing not only the photo, but also some of the graphics to your employer. Uh, 13th Street, excuse me, 13th Street was originally named Juniper Street because it's directly under a small street uh, that runs by City Hall, Juniper. But this was originally called Juniper. Over the years, uh, again, as we mentioned, you know, the subway has aged. This was a photo taken in the late 1970s. Uh, you can see the generally rundown condition of both 
the trolley car 2168 with its dents it's missing number uh you can see the weeds have gotten out of control uh the sign which says danger do not enter doesn't light anymore um but moving ahead into the 1980s the availability of federal funding you can see see the urban mass transit uh administration project today fta uh, funded a reconstruction of the 40th street plaza which included the removal of 40th street 40th street itself used to cross directly in front of the portal sorry about that um you can see later these stations are they're by and large still there a well-lit attractive place for passengers to wait at least um this particular photo was a robert king photo taken on a fan trip uh, on new year's eve some years back since that time, again, the portal has changed somewhat. It's been re-landscaped. Uh, they're looking, there was a business at one time next to the portal, which has since closed, but the building is still there. Um, but we talked about the subway itself and its construction, its maintenance. Some, not everything goes as planned. Uh, this particular photo was taken during the efforts to get the communications-based train control system, the CBTC system, some called cab signals, up and running. Uh, there were a lot of challenges when this system was originally put in place. Um, that's not necessarily uncommon. Uh, we're not going to dive into whether the existing line, the previous line of sight system with partial signaling or CBTC, pros, cons, um, there's a lot of factors that go into it. If you're ever curious, one of the best layman's references that I would recommend if you're curious about signaling on an operation like this is Al Fazio's book on light rail operations in New Jersey. He talks about pros and cons, challenging with signaling systems like CBTC, like automatic train operation. However, the good news in this story is after the system was tweaked, put into operation, the bugs worked out, a follow-on report demonstrated that the throughput capacity of the subway with the new system has now equaled and actually improved upon the previous line of sight capacity. So it was an eventual improvement. It did come with some pain. So we mentioned things not always going well. This was a 1955 fan trip on the Route 37 and due to a high guardrail, um, all eight wheels of this car are on the ground out uh, somewhere roughly near 94th Street. Right. This is an Ernie, Ernie Moser uh, charter. Ernie was the operator, and he took the photo, and it was the first time that a PCC car ever went out this far on the old Route 37 right away. And the high guardrails uh, didn't get along with the PCC wheels, and all of a sudden, Ernie had all eight wheels off the tracks. I'm not sure how, how they got how they got it rerailed. He never did tell me that. But you can see here, this was Ernie was able to snap the shot while he waited for relief and some help. Um, talking of subway mishaps, not, this may not necessarily be a mishap, but the uh, blizzard of February 1978 actually blew snow two stories down at 30th Street Station onto the subway itself. Uh, Dave Horowitz captured this shot. Uh, after the blizzard at least had stopped, um, it's probably the only photo of snow that far into the subway. Um, and car 2168 again just happened to be there. This was a theme of a previous trolleyology we conducted. And despite the warning sign at the subway portal itself, that has not stopped various vehicles, rubber tired vehicles, from following the trolleys into the tunnel. Uh, Harry and I talked uh, earlier as we were putting this together about a produce truck, which in, around 1955 followed a car in. The, uh, the driver was told, just follow the trolley. Well, he did, even into the tunnel. Um, the shot on the left, Ernie Mosier captured in the mid-1960s. So it was a rather nice looking Mustang convertible. Uh, yes, they are towing it out with a trolley car. Uh, this does still happen to this day. The photo on the right was taken December 5th. This is very recent, yeah. Yeah, December 5th, that was an operator's view of what they encountered when they found an automobile. So, and according to, um, according to the newspaper, the produce truck in the late 50s uh, actually got as far in as the second station at 36th Street. And 
They claim there were peppers and tomatoes and all types of vegetables all over the tracks. But he got in as far as two stations. How they got him out, I don't know. So today's current system is shown here in green with the exception of the Route 15. Uh, I realize some of the folks here, you may not be familiar with Philadelphia Route 15, although shown in green from 63rd and Girard to Richmond, Westmoreland is not one of the subway surface lines. Uh, otherwise, this shows the general, I'll say, schematic view of the routes. And now we're going to take a deeper dive into these routes. So let's talk about the routes both today, which are still in operation, as well as those which have operated the subway during its life. Route 10 itself is still in operation. Um, the, a lot of the data for this material came from the late Bob Hughes. Uh, PTC maintained a file of the streetcar routes and later the bus routes as well, all their routings and configurations. Uh, some of this, I think, was at one time reprinted by the Metropolitan Philadelphia Railway Association. Uh, Bob graciously, graciously gave the Friends Philadelphia Trolleys a copy of this book. And that's where a lot of this data has been pulled from. So Route 10 itself dates back prior to 1887, pre-electric days. Um, the route itself entered the subway for the first time December 15th, 1906. Um, was rerouted between 1906 and 1926 uh, from portions of two different routes. There was a minor change in 1946 to change the terminus from 63rd and Lancaster to 63rd and Malvern, which remains the current terminus of the line. Okay. One, one thing we haven't mentioned so far is route numbers. Route numbers started to be put in in 1911. Uh, as they put the near side cars on the lines, they began the route numbers. So 1911 is when the route numbers started. This view here shows is from SEPTA's current map. It shows the Route 10, the current routing, see primarily on Lancaster Avenue in West Philadelphia, uh, terminating at 63rd, which is almost at the city line. Uh, and for each of these views of the routes, we're going to take selected views going east to west. Uh, of course, you know, we're not, we, we talked about the subway itself, Route 10 starts in the subway. You can see here a Kawasaki car in the, around the, in the early 1990s. Um, this was an interesting photo. Yes, that is a PCC car on Route 10 long after the PCC cars in the subway were replaced by the modern Kawasaki cars. Why? Around 1987, there was a maintenance problem, uh, which was tracked specific to Callahill Depot, uh, that required the Kawasaki cars to be pulled out of service for roughly one month. Uh, to maintain service, PCC cars went back into regular operation in the subway in 1987 on Route 10. Uh, Harry was there uh, just about every weekend yeah. capturing photos. Uh, so no, it's not a fan trip. There was actually PCC service briefly returned to at least part of the subway surface in 1987. 24th Street Station, uh, as the cars headed west on the 10, of course, this was replaced by the tunnel in 1955. This is at 30th Street Station coming off the old Market Street Bridge. Car 8042 is still in existence at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. Uh, it's currently undergoing restoration. Uh, I really commend the folks at PTM, the volunteers at PTM for keeping this project going. Right. 8042 uh, was worked out of Callahill uh, on Route 10 and 38. So it ran in the subway from 1941 until the PCCs took over in 1955. Looking further west, this is the 36 and Ludlow. Some call it 36 and Market. Ludlow was actually a parallel street just south of Market, uh, the, the portal for Route 10 after 1955. This was an interesting photo that, that would probably be very hard to capture today. Uh, this was a fan trip in 1998 on a Sunday um, where traffic conditions allowed the group to uh, temporarily block traffic on Market Street and capture a a somewhat unique photo with the Philadelphia skyline in the background. Moving west, we're on Lancaster Avenue around roughly around 58th Street here in the 1960s. And then here on 63rd Street in an Ed, a photo from Ed Springer's collection, um, shortly after some of the 8,000 series cars were rehabilitated, 
into what were called paint liners. You can see the, the replica wings and some of the other features of the rebuilding. Route 11, Route 11 was established well prior to 1887 as what was called the Darby Line. Uh, its early route was just a 49th and Woodland and 9th and Main Streets in Darby Borough. For those not from the Philadelphia area, it's actually across the city line in Delaware County. Uh, Woodland Avenue itself is a very old road. It was part of the King's Highway to Wilmington, Delaware, colonial days. Um, portions of this opened as a horse car line in roughly 1858. Uh, this portion of the subway surface on Woodland Avenue arguably is the oldest routing. Uh, again, some of that states from horse car days uh, in the 1850s. The line itself was routed into the subway and called the Darby Subway Line in December of 1906. And essentially since that time, the route is largely unchanged. This is a current day map of the 11. Again, this is SEPTA's current map. It's available on the website. Starting at 13th Street, uh, car 9000, the class leader. This is a photo taken um, in some of the trackage, which has since been put in the tunnel in West Philadelphia. Here we are at the subway portal at 40th Street. As we mentioned, you could see at that time, uh, 40th Street still crossed the uh, what would later become a reserve plaza at grade. Uh, you can see pens at that time, new uh, high-rise dormitories on the left. Uh, Someone with an antique bus had posed it there. No, the, the city subway, Route 7 in Newark does not go into Philadelphia's subway. Yeah, this is a Richard Bible site. Richard, Rich took this. This is a track reconstruction on Woodland Avenue in the 1970s, uh, one of several renewal projects done in the relatively early days of SEPTA uh, prior to the introduction of the Kawasaki cars. Here's car 2168 again at Woodland Avenue and Island Road derailed. Um, though the, uh, the person under the car is supposed to be there. Uh, that's not what caused the derailment, but this was a, a track switch. A series of cars derailed. I know as part of Harry's collection, he has a number of cars at this location. I think this was around 1975, roughly. 77. 77. Um, this is another view of the same intersection. This is Route 11. Uh, pull out coming down Island Road onto Woodland. Uh, interestingly, the, the brick paving and the stone paving was there until roughly the mid 1980s when a track reconstruction replaced it. This is the Route 11. Again, this is in Darby at the Baltimore and Ohio Railroad crossing. This crossing is still active, used by CSX. It is the last remaining surface grade crossing on the Philadelphia system. There are others. Uh, elsewhere in the United States today, but this is the only one left in Philadelphia. There's another, whoops, this is another view of the B&O crossing in its current state. Um, you can see 9093, which was briefly wrapped to commemorate 125 years of, of street railway service, electric street railway service in Philadelphia. And the Route 11 ends at the Darby Terminal. And this is an era when you could find various types of cars in various colors. Uh, both on the streetcars and the connecting buses right at that time. In the rear, you'll see, see um, car 2054, uh, the last Philadelphia air car, which is now preserved up, up at Electric City. And the current day view of Darby Terminal, um, you can see here two of the Kawasaki cars in, the, in their current state and what the, what the service in Darby looks like today. Moving on to Route 13, this is the last route to be to enter the subway and, and become a subway surface route. Uh, it was originally a surface route. It was created in 1918, at least this portion of it, uh, from 9th and Main Streets in Darby to Front and Chestnut, via Chester Avenue in West Philadelphia. Uh, the Western Terminus was changed a couple of times. First, it was uh, set in 1918 at 65th and King Sessing, also known as the Mount Moriah Loop outside the historic Mount Moriah Cemetery. Uh, service on this line was heavy. Uh, the terminals were, were changed a couple times in the west uh, to account for that. Uh, it was later moved west to Yaden Loop. Uh, and then a shuttle, Route 62, which we'll mention very briefly, uh, connected Darby with Mount Moriah, later Darby with Yaden until 1971. 
Route 13 operated as a surface only route until September 9th in 1956. As we mentioned, it did absorb the former Route 62 shuttle between Yaden and Darby in 1971. Today, it is used primarily for car house pull-ins and pull-outs. Not all of the Route 62 trackage uh, is still serviceable. This is a view of Route 13, the current day SEPTA map. You can see uh, Yaden Loop. Uh, you can see the Mount Moriah Loop, which is still used for short-term trips, uh, as well as the, the portion in Darby at the far left. As I mentioned, Route 13 was originally a surface route uh, running to Front Street. You can see here um, the 2600 car went in the days uh, when both the car was new and service still extended to the waterfront. There's Bookbinder's Restaurant in the background for those uh, familiar with that old establishment in Philadelphia. Not everything goes as planned. Um, this is a Route 13 car uh, striking the side of a Route 36 car. Here in the in slightly after the SEPTA takeover, late 1960s, you can see a Route 13 car exiting the subway portal at 40th Street. This shot from Roger Dupuy, who wrote a book on Philadelphia trolleys, is seen here at 49th Street. This photo I, I definitely had to include for Harry. That's the former Most Blessed Sacrament Church uh, on Chester Avenue at 58th. Uh, Harry, along with many others, uh, attended uh, Catholic school here growing up. At one time, this was the largest Catholic school in the United States. Um, the church is still there. It is closed, but it is still a, um, still a landmark, uh, still makes an attractive photo if the traffic conditions will allow. As I mentioned, Mount Moriah Loop, this is how it looked uh, around 1980. Um, the infrastructure could use a little help. The trolleys definitely could use a little bit of maintenance help at that time. You can see the vandalism, et cetera. Route car 2054, as Harry mentioned, was somewhat famous in Philadelphia for being repainted back to silver in 1978. It was used and retained after other cars of its type were disposed of. Uh, here it is uh, at 65th Street on a fan trip in 1988 uh, by the late operator Abe Pacheco. And the Route 13 terminates in Yaden. This is a photo of the Yaden terminal with uh, a PCC2 car, which normally doesn't operate here, as well as the remaining tower car, 2194. Now, as I mentioned, the end of the Route 13 uh, one time was a shuttle route. So I, I consider an honorable mention for a subway route, Route 62. Uh, it originally used Bernie cars uh, for the shuttle. After the Bernies, the last of them were retired in 1948. Various other types of cars were used on the line, uh, including 80 hundreds. This was a photo of 8534, um, representing the type of equipment used on the 62 on a fan trip in the late 1990s. Route 34, uh, the Angora subway route, as it was called, remains in operation. This is the shortest of the subway surface routes. Uh, the, the route to 61st and Baltimore streets, the terminus, which remains a current terminus, uh, dates back to 1896. It was uh, routed into the subway in 1906. Interestingly, it was discontinued the following year, then reestablished the figure after that. Uh, since that time, it's essentially unchanged of course, other than the Western subway extensions we already talked about. Current day map of the 34. 34 car decorated for the holidays. as a Bill Monahan photo, as you probably imagine. 34 car at 30th Street Station, uh, not long before the 8000 series uh, were replaced in subway surface. Uh, this is a photo courtesy of Ed Springer's collection. This is a Route 34 pullout at 49th Street. You can see the track reconstruction in this area at that time. This was an interesting shot at 52nd Street. Uh, I threw this in, you know, it really sets the period of time in the early 1950s uh, with the types of ads, uh, promotions for television at that time. And, you know, the, the various uh, beers and whatnot you could find at Philadelphia, even tires for your own. Here's 54th and Baltimore 
taken on a fan trip. As I mentioned, the PCC2 cars are not normally used for service here, but a rather a, attractive shot uh, of the typical neighborhoods you would find along Baltimore Avenue, especially in this stretch. A view uh, roughly at 60th Street in a snowstorm from Bill Monahan. Um, and then the terminus at 61st in Baltimore. This was a fan trip. Uh, you'd see car 5205 at that time. Today, this car is under restoration at the Electric City Trolley Museum. Uh, it's here at 61st in Baltimore on a fan trip. It was painted orange uh, before it left the city. Somewhat current day view of 61st in Baltimore in the snow. And then you look at the photo on the left. It's an interesting photo, but I had to include this for a reason. Yes, there's part of a tree in it. The photo on the left is the first trolley photograph ever taken by Harry Donnan. Route 34 is kind of special to Harry. It was his first, the first trolley route he ever took photos of. Um, it's a route, uh, a route my late father used to ride from time to time with his mother. He lived just across the city line. Um, so on a fan trip about a year ago, uh, Bill Monahan and I had to get a picture of Harry with the same tree same with tree. the trolley in the background. So, it looks like the tree got a little wild. Here, and so did I. <laughs> <laughs> so if you go to 61st in Baltimore and you see that tree directly across the street from, uh, directly across 61st Street, um, it's now known as Harry's Tree. Yeah. Finally, the current route's Route 36. Um, the route itself, like most routes, dates prior to the subway opening, in this case, 1904, from the then western end of the line at Elmwood and Island uh, to Grace Ferry Road. The Route 36 was combined with parts of the Route 37 and routed into the subway in November 1955. Uh, that line itself was then subsequently cut back in stages, first from what was called 94th Street, then 88th Street in 1962, and then finally the current terminus uh, at 80th Street in 1975. Otherwise, the route is unchanged. This is the Route 36 current day map. Here's a Route 36 car boarding in the subway in the 1960s. And then after the SEPTA takeover, you can see a, 30, a battered Route 36 car uh, leaving the subway at the 40th Street portal. This was a track reconstruction at 49th Street. You can see here with 36 car turning. Harry caught this shot of what was then the MAB paint factory along Route 36. This was a special fan trip with car 2732. This photo taken outside Bartram's Gardens, located along Route 36, a night shot from Bill Monahan. Looking further west on Elmwood Avenue in the PCC era. 67th and Elmwood, some of the former General Electric buildings, which are now gone. There is an Amazon warehouse constructed in this area. Uh, also the short-lived uh, yellow paint scheme, commonly called the banana. And the terminus at one time of the Route 36 still used the short turns in Elmwood and Island. Uh, this trackage is now part of the property that Elmwood Depot sits on. You can still short turn a car here. That has not changed. Um, but there is the Elmwood Depot now at this site as well. Uh, that was the safety car. Uh, it's interesting to note. You can see it here. Uh, motorists use their signals, but obviously someone did not based upon all the dents on the front of the safety car. Route 36 continues out along Island Road, in center reservation uh, here in the PTC era, a car gone to 94th Street in the snow. Later cut back, this was a fan trip. Uh, can, the former Kansas City cars, the 2251 series cars normally did not operate here, uh, but you can see this was a 1960s era fan trip. Then cut back to 88th Street. And then finally cut back to 80th Street in this relatively modern scene. So let's briefly talk about routes which operated the subway, at least for one period of time. Uh, the Route 30 did very briefly, 1913 to 1919. Uh, the route itself 
It was uh, removed from the subway and terminated at 40th and Market until 1990, in December of 1919. The remaining route itself was converted to bus in 1950. I don't have a photo. Harry and I searched for a Route 30 car in the subway era. We did have one after that at the 65th and Vine Streets terminus. Yeah, this, was a, this was a Sunday only PCC route. Had PCCs on Sunday and 8,000s on the other, other days of the week. And as mentioned, this is after the subway era, but we wanted to at least provide a Route 31 uh, photo in the presentation. Or excuse me, Route 30. Route 31 was also a subway route. Uh, interestingly enough, it was the first subway route. This was the first line. At that time, it didn't have a number. It's called the 63rd and Vine Streets line. Uh, it was the first subway route, December 15th, 1905. It came out of the subway in 1907 went back in the subway in 1930, then terminated again east of the subway entrance in 1949, uh, later converted to bus operation. Here is a Route 31 car, compliments of Ed Springer's collection. He was able to get one for us uh, in the subway era. Route 37 is somewhat fondly remembered, definitely one of the more interesting routes that once served the subway. Uh, it was a subway route for 44 years. It was commonly called the Chester Short Line. That was its, one of its early names. Uh, it was established as a subway route. And the original far, if you want to say Southern terminus, was third in Market Streets in the city of Chester, which is also in Delaware County, well outside the city line. Uh, the route itself, the first cutback came after an accident uh, between a trolley car and a truck, which destroyed the Crumb Creek Bridge in the summer of 1946. Uh, the route, there was a short-term loop constructed prior to that at Westinghouse, uh, the former Westinghouse had a large plant at, in uh, Essington, which is in Delaware County. Uh, the route was cut to there in 1946. Rail service ended November 1955, shortly before the final part of the subway opened, and it was combined with Route 36. Here's a shot of a 37 car on Woodland Avenue in West Philadelphia in the 1930s. These next series of photos were taken by the late Ernie Moser. These are really, we definitely had to include these. These are really some somewhat, if you want to say, bucolic scenes along what today is Island Road. The Island Road trackage was on the side of the road at that time. It was prior to its reconstruction and the widening of Island Road. This is one of Ernie's shots from the early 1940s of a 37 car on Island Road. Uh, notice the trees, notice it's, it's pretty much uh, rather sparse in terms of, uh, of buildings. This is during the reconstruction of the 37 into the median of Island Road. This is after the work was constructed on an NRHS fan trip. This is a photo further down on Eastwick Avenue beyond the current end of the line at 80th Street. There were some structures out there at that point, most of which are long gone. This is, whoops, this is the Westinghouse Loop. Uh, this was the terminus of the line after the fire destroyed the bridge. This is a shot of one of, the, of, one of several trestles uh, on the 37 beyond the Westinghouse Loop. Uh, you can see the ice, obviously, taken in the winter. This is another Ernie Moser shot taken along the 37. Uh, you can see the stairs up to the uh, to a waiting platform. You can see the Reading Railroad behind the trolley. Another Ernie Moser shot almost at the Baldwin Locomotive Works, the Sline Service Baldwin. And then finally here in downtown Chester, um, this photo was taken roughly 1935. You can see the, uh, if, if you look closely in the car windows, the National Recovery Act flyer, uh, just some of the advertisements at that time in Chester. Uh, there's fancy beef cuts by the uh, butcher's truck, the ice cream. <laughs> What's Esslinger's beer? Another popular beer at the time, Esslinger's. Philadelphia had a lot of local breweries back then, and Esslinger's was one of the premium ones at that time. And you got to get some humor today out of the advertisement. I don't think today uh, we would tell you to be safe with a traffic light and a waving policeman after you drank a few <laughs> Esslinger's beers. But uh, advertising and the, the, the state of what was dangerous for you back then was a little bit different.
Finally, of the subway routes Route 38, which Harry mentioned earlier, um, along Bering Street in West Philadelphia, the earliest origins of this route, again, date prior to 1887. Uh, the records Bob Hughes provided us uh, are pretty, they pretty much started in 1887. It wasn't consistent data earlier than that. Um, but the Bering Street subway line from what was then 44th and Elm Streets was established on August 7th of 1908. The route was modified and the terminus of the subway line was later established at 44th and Parkside or the Parkside Loop. As Harry mentioned, this route was uh, converted to bus prior to the opening of the subway extensions and ended in 1955 as a railroad. Here's a Route 38 shot. Uh, this is also from Ed Springer's collection. Uh, nothing like advertising uh, electrical gifts at the holidays. I imagine they did not mean smartphones, iPads, and things like that back then. Another shot of the 38, this time in later years, uh, with an 8000 uh, towards the end of rail service on Route 38. We're going to take a little diversion for a moment, namely talk about how subway surface cars are routed when the subway is closed. Uh, the former diversion route, a large portions of it were the former Route 14, a shuttle route uh, in West Philadelphia. There are portions of the trackage on Spruce, you can see some trackage on Filbert. This route exists so that when the subway tunnel is closed, you know, at one time it was closed certain weeknight. In recent years, SEPTA has done a trolley tunnel blitz uh, for roughly two weeks where all cars are routed uh, to the 40th and Market Streets subway station. This route facilitates those kind of reroutings. If the tunnel has to close for an emergency, uh, this facilitates it. Right, most of the diversion route, as you can see on 40th, 41st, and 38th Street and so forth, that was part of uh, old route 40 which ran from Parkside down to Front and South. So just about all of the diversion track is uh, left over from Route 40, which was a very heavy line. And uh, FBT, Friends of the Charlie's contributor, Mike Salagi did this, uh, did this graphic. We're really grateful for it. Uh, Mike also did a lot of our artwork, including some of our logos. This is a scene along 42nd Street. It still has car tracks. This is another one of Ernie Moser's photos. You, I really like how he captured the shade trees. This portion on 42nd Street was the Burning Shuttle Route 14. Uh, scene still looks pretty similar today. It's very popular for fan trips because it is one of the more rather photogenic spots on the system. It's just not used regularly. And a shot in the present day of the diversion route. Uh, you can see traffic conditions also are somewhat uh, Somewhat challenging for the operators, particularly during the, during the weekdays. And note the destination sign of the 34 car, 40th and Market. As we've gone through the routes, we've talked about and tried to illustrate purposely different colors, different types of the rolling stock, the equipment used on the lines. We're going to briefly talk about each type of equipment which has been used in the subway since it opened. The first cars to operate in the subway after it was open were called the Philadelphia Standard Cars. These were the cars that inaugurated service in 1905. J.G. Brill built seven, a total of 772 of these cars in 13 different orders for PRT's predecessors and later PRT from 1899 to 1906. Um, Harold Cox's book, Early Electric Cars Philadelphia, really goes into the, the details on these cars. What I'm presenting is just a summary level uh, there's a common misconception all these cars were semi-convertibles and that the windows could be basically what a semi-convertible is. The windows could open all the way up into pockets of the roof. Not all 772 cars were constructed that way. Some used a convertible window sash. What that meant was the windows could be removed in their entirety. But a convertible in Philadelphia is not the same if you're familiar with like a Brooklyn convertible or a Baltimore convertible where the entire side basically came off. Uh, just the windows could be removed. As I mentioned, these were the first type of cars used in the subway surface. Uh, interesting to note, as they were originally converted um, to having doors on the platforms rather than open platforms, the unconverted cars were used in the subway because they felt the doors slowed down the loading. 
Uh, and largely these were displaced when the near side cars came in 1911. Here's a shot of one of the Philadelphia standards. Uh, one of the challenges with these cars when they were first used in the subway to the stub end terminal was having to swing the pole around. Uh, so the subway cars later, and as did most of the Philadelphia standards, get a second pole to make this a little easier. Uh, this is taken at Woodland Depot. The last surviving Philadelphia standard car, 2282, is at Electric City in Scranton. Um, it is in very tired condition. Uh, it would be a rather challenging restoration. Uh, I do think the Electric City folks deserve a lot of credit though. It's in a high quality building where at least it won't deteriorate any further. Uh, and perhaps one day can be restored uh, at a home that has the appropriate resources and capabilities to restore it, if not in Scranton. The near side cars came next in 1911. Uh, there were five different groups of these, five different orders to Brill, uh, a total of 1,500 identical cars. It's interesting, this was the largest, the most common type of streetcar used in Philadelphia. Uh, but interestingly enough, they largely were displaced from the subway operation with the coming of the 8,000 series cars only 12 years later. The near sides, though, still had a very long service life. Uh, last one was not retired until 1955, although it was not in the subway at that time. This is a photo of a near side signed up for the subway for Route 38 uh, Bering Street. Harry has managed to locate this photo. Um, there are, it is very difficult to find photos of the near sides in the subway uh, because of the duration of time they ran there. There were the 4,000 and 5,000 series cars. These were double-ended cars in 1918. These were two fleets that were different. They were similar in appearance. They, they look almost the same. The difference being the 4,000 series cars as they were originally constructed were built for use in multiple unit trains, whereas the 5,000 cars were not. Although the 5,000 cars could tow a trailer during Philadelphia's brief experiment with trailers. The 5,000 series cars really dominated the Chester short line until 1946 uh, when the bridge burn and the line was uh, configured for single ended vehicles. The last 4,000 car was retired in 1955, the 5,000 is a year later. Interestingly enough, these cars were popular to become utility cars. Um, the last one, U34 was at Woodland, uh, looked much like a passenger car, but just painted green. Uh, but it was destroyed, unfortunately, when Woodland Car House burned to the ground in 1975. As I mentioned, these were, you know, many people thought of these cars as the Chester Shortline cars. This is a 4,000 car after it lost its couplers on the 37. It's a great view from Ernie Moser of a 37 car headed outbound at 30th Street Station. This is a U28, one of the utility cars is another Ernie Moser photo. What's interesting is the car is being en route to Woodland Depot um, to get its tools and you see the, the various equipment removed. It would be reconverted back to a passenger car for World War II. The 8,000 series cars came in 1923. There were 535 of these cars built in three different orders. Uh, one of the unique things about these cars was they enabled the first one-man operation in the subway in 1923. Uh, and they really dominated subway operations until the PCCs came. What's interesting is I know many of us associate the PCC car uh, era, where, you know, we can read that resonates with us in Philadelphia. Oddly enough, the 8,000 cars operated longer in the subway than the PCCs did. There are three cars surviving. Only one of the surviving cars was used regularly in the subway, car 8042 at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum. Here's a photo of class leader 8000, uh, roughly in 1940, outside 30th Street Station. This was prior to the uh, rebuilding program in the early 1940s. Here's a shot of two 8000s outside 30th Street. Now, a way you could tell an 8,000 car used in the subway surface, as opposed to those that didn't, if you look at the photo on the right, you'll see there are three lights above the rear windows. You had the rear marker light. You had to the left and right of that are battery powered lights. Why? That way, if there was a battery circuit in the car, that way, if the pole came off in the subway, there would be some lighting for a following car. Uh, only the subway cars had this, for example, car 8534, which did not run into the subway until, you know, it, 
roughly until the 1990s, um, does not have these lights because it wasn't regularly operated there. This is a shot of an 8,000 on the 62. Uh, you can see at Yaden, what's interesting here is the Route 13 is using PCCs, but the 62 is not. I think this photo dates from roughly 1955. I think this is also another Ernie Moser. In car 8042 at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum, undergoing a, an extensive restoration. And again, I, I commend the volunteers for keeping this project moving. It'll be a wonderful day when this car is done. So the PCC cars, they came to Philadelphia long before 1955, but they didn't operate the subway until 1955. Um, shortly before the tunnel extensions were open, uh, the PCCs replaced the 8,000 series cars from the subway. Uh, originally, the only PCC cars used regularly in the subway were from the 1940 and 1942 orders uh, due to concerns from PTC's engineers, which were later disproven that cars that did not have tread brakes or wheel brakes would not reliably actuate the signal circuits. The all electric cars in Philadelphia, the, the 1947, 1948 cars had brakes. The, the final braking was uh, on a drum that was mounted on the motor shaft that didn't have a shoe that grabbed the wheel. Uh, PTC's engineers were concerned without having a shiny wheel polish, the signals might not actuate. That wasn't the case in fact in 1968, uh, the first of the all electric cars started to move to West Philadelphia. And then from that point on until 1982, cars from the 1940, 42, 47, and 48 orders all worked the subway routes until 1982. Interesting story about that. Uh, John Engelman, who's now an active member at the Baltimore Streetcar Museum, he worked for PTC from uh, when he was like 21 to 24 years old in the 1960s. And originally he worked Germantown with 2700 all electrics. Then he transferred to Woodland, uh, usually on Route 13. So one day he's go he goes into Juniper Street and a dispatcher says to him, are you familiar with Route 10? John says, yes. He says, well, they got a problem in down. He says, I need to get a westbound Route 10 car. Change your route number and go out as a 10 and then come back in as a 10 and then we'll put you back on your 13 route. So John goes out on 10, makes the westbound run, gets out to 63rd and Malvern and he has car trouble with the air car. So he calls in and they said, well, take the car to Callahill, which is not far from Route 10. Take the car to Callahill and get a car from there and come on back in. So he does. He goes into Callahill. Carmen says, well, the only car we got available, take that one in the front right there. There was a 2700. Well, John was qualified on them because he had worked at Germantown. He said, are you sure you want me to take that one? Yes. So he says, okay. And he goes. Goes in as a 10, gets to Juniper, changes to 13, makes a complete trip out on the 13, goes back in. He's coming back out at 40th Street on his second trip with the 2700, all electric. And there's a supervisor at, at the at 40th Street tunnel, at 40th Street portal. He runs out in front, waving his hands. He says, where did you get that thing? They don't run in the subway. John says, well, he says, you take that into Woodland and get another car. You can't use them in the subway. They were completely misinformed that the cars without tread brakes would not actuate the signals. But it wasn't until 1968 when they were going to rehab the Girard Avenue Bridge and close it that they would not be able to get cars up to Portland Shop, the main shop. So they realized they had to get the older cars because they were going to lose the Girard Avenue Bridge for up to three years. They had to get the older cars up into North Philly and get the newer all-electrics down into West Philly. But it was they were fanatical about that. You could not run them in the subway because they didn't have tread brakes. Another story from Ernie Moser and Mervyn Borgness when the first PCCs came in, 
the engineers at PTC felt that Juniper Street, the curves leading into Juniper Street and the subway would have to be redone to handle PCC cars. That was also a, a wrong engineering uh, statement. So the PCCs would not run in the subway until 1955. But uh, so there were all kinds of things going on that were proven later to be false. But Ang John Engelman tells that story better than I do. He said, where did you get that thing? Take it into Woodland and get rid of it. And he said he had no problems at all in the subway with the, with the uh, signals, none at all. Thanks, Harry. Uh, some of these stories, you just, you know, it's wonderful. The people that operate it between, you know, the story Harry said about John, Ernie's stories and, Stories folks like Bill Monahan. I mean, it adds a richness to this that the, the photos and the, and the text just uh, doesn't do by itself. The PCC era in the subway ended in 1982, at least regular service. Yes, uh, there were fan trips and other things long after that. Uh, but for seven day week subway operation, that ended in 1982. The PCC cars, many of them were rehabbed of the later orders. Uh, they worked till 1992 until 18 of them were one more reconstructed one more time, completely rebuilt for Route 15. You can see here, uh, PTC was not shy about advertisements, not to the extent Pittsburgh was, uh, but you can see here, uh, you could save money with a Whirlpool washer. Here's a PCC on Route 11, uh, in the, still in the PTC era. In fact, you could see you could, they're advertising for a new 1956 Dodge. And I've tried to show a car from each order. If you're curious, there was the first order, well, the 1940 order, I should say. This is 1942. Uh, here you can see 2578 at the 40th Street portal on Route 34 uh, in the Gulf Oil era, as the paint colors were commonly referred to. 2600 series car at 63rd and Malvern on the 10. As Harry mentioned, the first all electrics came to West Philadelphia around 1968. Uh, car 2168 was in the first group. Local resident Dave Horowitz uh, snapped this shot not long after the car arrived. He was uh, fascinated to see one of these in West Philadelphia. 2700 cars later served some of them, not all, but some of them in West Philadelphia. Uh, 2791 was modeling the new SEPTA paint, which uh, was promptly vandalized. This was prior to the rebuild program where all the rebuilt cars, uh, with the exception of work cars, were painted white. And finally, car 2176 on the 13, uh, you can see the gold colors, which were an experiment. This was also the car which was experimentally air conditioned. Uh, this car, unfortunately, was destroyed in the Woodland Car House fire. And as Harry mentioned, car 2054 survives. This is here it is in, in storage and in protected storage in Scranton. Uh, the Friends Philadelphia Trolleys and Electric City Trolley Museum are working together on a long term plan that will lead to the eventual restoration of this car. And probably the most popular preserved uh, PCC car from Philadelphia, certainly the one that runs the most in a museum, car 2168, uh, here at the Baltimore Streetcar Museum. And um, with the success of 2168's restoration, uh, the Friends Philadelphia Trollers are hoping we can do the same with the 2054. And then finally, today's generation, the Kawasaki light rail cars uh, came first in 1980. They were constructed by Kawasaki Heavy Industries uh, with the final assembly of the production cars. The prototype car 9000 was built in Japan. The production cars were built here. By 1982, these replaced the PCCs on all the subway surface routes and continue to provide that to this day. Uh, interestingly enough, the Kawasaki cars are the car type which has operated the longest in the subway surface. See here a, car, a shot of car 9000 still in Japan. It's a shot from Harry's collection in 9006. Uh, early in its service stage, you can see a PCC was still running on the 34. Uh, you can note the original color scheme with the wide stripe. The color scheme was later uh, somewhat modified. This was the first generation of the modifications, car 9028 outside Yaden, back when the car still had roll signs. 
a more modern day look at Yaden uh, with 90-37 in the current paint scheme and 90-43 in the rapid war for a period of time. And then this shot taken from a fan trip in 1999, showing the three longest used types of cars in the subway in Philadelphia. We'll take a brief look at some of the other equipment which operated in the subway or in support of it. First of all, the, we had to put this in. This quote is from Harold Cox's book, Early Electric Cars of Philadelphia. Can you picture this in the subway service? Hmm. It was a single truck. There was a group of single truck cars in the 1500 series. This is a 1400 series car. This is not one of those cars. That's one of the closest things we can find in a clear photo. There were a series of single truck cars that were briefly used for tripper service in the subway. Uh, as we mentioned, Cox uh, made this quote in his book. Uh, this is not one of those cars. It's comparable, just to give you an idea of uh, a subway experience on a single truck car relatively early in the trolley era. There were two tower cars at Woodland Depot uh, prior to it being destroyed. D37 and D38. This is a shot of D38 in the subway. Not a great shot, but at least a photo of it in the subway. Here's D38 with D37 behind it in the Woodland Depot where both the depot and D38 would be destroyed in a fire. Another car from the Broad Street subway was reconstructed into a tower car D39 by a contractor. It took a number of years, made one trip through the subway. It had clearance problems. It left. SEPTA then, uh, the last two PCC cars to be rehabilitated were converted into tower cars. Uh, one of them remains on SEPTA property, car 2194, uh, seen here outside Mount Moriah Cemetery. This car is still used occasionally. The, the W Series roadway work cars, a number of these were used in support of the subway surface lines. These were originally built as double cab cars. This is during a track reconstruction project near Callahill Depot. One survived a lot longer than others, W56. It later got a single cab, was rebuilt, a more modern crane. Bill Monahan uh, spearheaded the effort to save this car from scrap through a partnership with the Electric City Trolley Museum and the Baltimore Streetcar Museum. Uh, this is shortly after Bill rounded up the loading ramp and the crew from both museums who helped load it. Uh, this car is in storage in Baltimore, but is planned to be restored to operation and utilized. There was also a series of flat cars purchased from Toronto. Uh, one lasted longer than the others, W61. Uh, this is when it looked, uh, it still looked half decent. This car was later put into storage uh, and on the verge of being scrapped, a partnership between Electric City, Baltimore, and the Friends Philadelphia Trolleys is funding a restoration and move of this car to the National Capital Trolley Museum, where it will be used again for work service. Thankfully, despite some vandalism, the car is structurally sound and in relatively decent shape. Um, and again, a combination of museums have saved this car from scrap as well. And finally, snow sweepers. Granted, other than uh, perhaps in February 1978, uh, you don't have to deal with snow in the subway, but the routes on the surface certainly did. Uh, there were a number of sweepers assigned to Woodland and Callahill depots. This is car C-145, which was assigned to Woodland for its entire service life. This is in the late 1960s. Ed Springer captured this shot uh, during an operator training exercise. This car really has been a success story. It later went to a series of museums, eventually the Baltimore Streetcar Museum, uh, and its restoration was brought back to the condition shown here, and it continues to be improved, uh, largely as a youth-led project. First an Eagle Scout, and then two other young individuals uh, being mentored have helped uh, transform a rather deteriorated sweeper into what's currently the only Philadelphia sweeper operating. Um, and it's gotten quite popular in Baltimore. It's also used as a general work car in Baltimore, not just for sweeping snow. And in the words, never say never, um, do PCC two cars operate in the subway? No. However, car 2325 seen here did. Uh, there was a, the car was coming back from a shop move and the operator who was a, not a operator for passenger service, um, 
pulled into the 40th Street portal and called and said, what do I do now? 2325 ran through the subway uh, and back out again. It cleared just fine. It did not have the cab signals. Uh, no, there has not been any other PCC2 operation in the subway since, uh, but 2325 is the only PCC2 car to run in the subway. Uh, and yes, that is a fact. So let's look to the future. The subway lines have been around since 1905. Um, there is a future for these lines, somewhat exciting. It's certainly going to come with a lot of challenges. SEPT has announced its trolley modernization program, uh, which will feature new equipment for the subway surface lines and an option for new equipment for Route 15. Uh, but in order to, lie, to bring the line into modern standards and compliance of the Americans with Disabilities Act, um, it's not as simple as buying cars. Uh, the rolling stock itself will need to be utilized uh, with level boarding and low platforms. This will replace SEPTA's many of their current curbside stops, uh, require accessibility changes for all of the stations. Uh, this is a, if you want to say, a, a conceptual view from the Delaware Valley uh, Regional Planning Commission. It's publicly available on their website. No, they're, they're, that is not necessarily the colors the cars are going to be painted. That's to be determined. Um, but let's think about this. Vehicles evolve over time. Uh, to many, the, the Kawasaki vehicles are still seen as modern. We replace the PCCs. Um, but by today's standards, they're not. Uh, in 1942, a 2600 PCC car was new. In 1982, Kawasaki car was new. Um, but the design itself, besides you know, expecting a, a street car to last for 40 years, yes, they can. Um, if you buy with federal funds, 25 years is the minimum service life. Uh, doesn't mean you have to scrap it, but we are realizing that investment in public transportation uh, does not mean making everything a museum piece. Uh, fabulous cars, extremely well designed. You know, they're, the challenges today of high platforms and multiple steps uh, combined with the age of the cars does warrant a replacement. You know, you compare the technology in 1982 to a modern streetcar line today. Uh, no, this is not Philadelphia. It's just an example. This is the Tempe streetcar. This is the newest new streetcar line to open in the United States, but gives you an idea how much technology uh, of the vehicles has evolved. Low floor, um, you know, in this case, multi-section articulated, which makes the low floor a lot easier, low floor configuration a lot easier. Uh, these cars have off-wire capabilities, not something SEPT is exploring, uh, but the technology has definitely evolved. This is publicly available information. This is some of the basic specs for SEPTA's new streetcar. SEPTA has published its specifications on their website. You can download them. You can look at all roughly 900 pages of them, and they are soliciting for offers. Um, just some basic facts about the new cars, at least what's in the specifications. Uh, an 80 foot car, plus or minus six feet. Um, Interior of maximum gradient, a minimum curve radius, 35 feet, seven inches. Um, there's a lot more. If you want to go through the specs, you can certainly see more. Uh, if you see the AW followed by a number, that has to do with the loading of the car. Um, exterior colors, TBD, and the base order is for 130 cars. That base order of 130 cars, it shows you how times have changed. In 1960, there were 166 air PCCs assigned to the five subway surface lines. So it sh shows the change in ridership. Uh, 166 PCCs. Uh, right now, there are 112 Kawasaki's for the city division. And uh, the fleet size that's proposed now for both suburban and city division is 130. Uh, it's going to be interesting to see, because one of the things we know, if you get a bigger car and then you feel, oh, well, we only have to run a car every 25 minutes, that's not going to work. People are either going to drive or they're going to call Uber or Lyft because they're not going to stand on a street corner for 25 minutes. So I don't know how they're going to schedule the cars. That's just my opinion. But as I mentioned, the... Um... It's going to require a complete transformation, and that's part of the plans. Um, new stations, 
you know, reconfigured streets, you know, see to coexist with bicycles and pedestrians. Uh, a new maintenance facility is needed. The, the length of the car exceeds the transfer table at uh, the Woodland Depot. Um, there's a lot of coordination involved. You have vehicles, you have a new maintenance facility, all the infrastructure improvements, you utilize the new vehicles. All of this needs to be coordinated and put together in, in an integrated and, uh, you know, part of an integrated master schedule. A lot of moving parts. SEPTA has its work cut out for it. You know, a conceptual view of what the new cars will look like out on the private right of way near Eastwick. And then as part of uh, some of SEPTA's public materials about the trolley modernization includes the concept of renaming the routes to the T, T1 through 5, uh, with the Gerard Avenue line being called the G. And the dash lines represent potential extensions. Remains to be seen if this happens or not. Uh, only time will tell. Uh, again, the, it's an interesting time. It's an exciting time. It's one that will definitely be challenging. Um, but it is time for new equipment. Uh, the Kawasaki cars have been fantastic. Um, but again, they're, uh, the, new, the newest one is 40 years old. So we're, we're talking about equipment, which to many of us still seems new, but to the current generation is anything but new. So before we wrap up, as I've tried to mention throughout, and Harry has as well, a number of people have made this presentation possible. We want to thank several key contributors. If we have missed anyone, you know, it comes with our apologies. We've also tried throughout this presentation to utilize material, which is either A, in Harry's collection, my collection, one of our contributors' collections, uh, is publicly available in the public domain, et cetera. We, we've, we've tried hard to make sure we're not violating anybody's copyrights. Uh, but a number of people made this possible beyond just Harry and I. They deserve special mention. Joe Basha, who provided a lot of the materials for this car, or excuse me, for this presentation, seen with Kawasaki Car 9000. Uh, Joe was part of the team which made these cars possible. Roger Dupuy on the left with Bill Monahan in the middle and Harry. Uh, Roger supplied several of the photos for this. Roger's the director of the Friends Philadelphia Trolleys. Um, you know, thank you, Roger, for your contributions. Roger also wrote a, a wonderful book on Philadelphia's trolleys. Definitely encourage you to get it if you don't have it. Dave Harwitz, uh, we don't have a lot of photos of Dave, but this is Dave out uh, posing with Bill Monahan's car. Dave is a co-founder of the Friends Philadelphia Trolleys. Uh, a number of the more unusual photos of this come from Dave. Uh, Dave is a true supporter of uh, preservation and history. And uh, you know the Friends Philadelphia Trolleys are really lucky to have Dave's support. The late Bob Hughes, we've mentioned in other presentations, uh, Bob here with the first PCC2 rebuilt car. Uh, Bob was very proud of that. Bob provided a lot of the information we use, as I mentioned, that uh, more or less encyclopedia of car and bus routes. I don't recall where he had acquired it from. Uh, Bob helped encourage the Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys to incorporate and get started. Um, just a wonderful individual and uh, someone who's dearly missed. Kristen Fredrickson on the right with Paul Grether. Uh, Kristen does not deserve enough, does not get, she doesn't get the credit she deserves. Not enough for putting these together. Uh, Kristen and Paul came on one of the Friends Philadelphia Trolley's fan trips. And yes, we, had, we definitely had to get her photo and she certainly warrants a special thanks. Bill Monahan on the right. Um, we joke with Bill, there's not a lot of photos of Bill smiling. So <laughs> the selection was somewhat limited. Um, Bill's a true professional in every sense of the word, operating trolleys for SEPTA since 1986, co-founder of the Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys, ardent supporter of trolley museums uh, through his contributions, his photographs, and in the case of Baltimore, a lot of physical hard work. Um, and he's smiling. What more could we say? Andrew Naughton must have had an effect. The late Ernie Moser, I, uh, excuse me, as we've mentioned throughout a lot of his photos and stories, uh, <laughs> Ernie was a very good friend of Harry's. You know, you look at the generations, you know, Ernie uh, in a lot of ways was to Harry what Bill Monahan is to many of uh, the current generation. Just an absolutely wonderful person, great photographer, loved trolleys, loved PCC cars. A number of photos in his collection are now part of the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum collection. Andrew Naughton. 
Andrew helped us, uh, you know, with a lot of questions about the presentation. Just does this look good? Does this not look good? What would you use? Um, Andrew has been heavily involved with the restoration of car C-145. Uh, Harry loves car 2168 and Andrew's uh, appreciation for C-145 is pretty much the same. Uh, but it's not just appreciation. He works on this car a lot, uh, as seen in this photo. Ed Scooches. Ed is a member of the East Penn Traction Club. Uh, Ed provided to us those sketches of the various arrangements of the 15th Street and the Juniper Street Terminal from the Lake Jack Force. Uh, they really helped make this presentation a lot easier. Ed heard about the presentation, reached out to me and said, would this help? Uh, thank you, Ed. It did help. Ed Springer, uh, known to so many, longtime employee SEPTA, and prior to that, PTC employee, uh, Ed made a lot of things possible, including fan trips. Ed has been an ardent supporter of the Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys, uh, provide a lot of material for this. Um, and post-retirement, we had to get a shot of Ed uh, enjoying car 9093 at one of our fan trips. Uh, and thank you, Ed, for all the things you've done and continue to do. Mike Salagi. Mike provided the graphics for the subway diversion route. Mike also has done a lot of the artwork for Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys. Uh, Mike's authored a book on Montgomery County trolleys. Uh, Arden Supporter of Preservation has a wonderful website. Um, and Mike, thank you for all you have done as well. A reminder, as shown, speaking of Mike's artwork, a reminder, the Friends of Philadelphia trolleys, our website is as follows, very simple, friendsofphiladelphiatrolleys.org, um, 2168, our first project, uh, which led to a lot of good things. Uh, we thank our supporters, especially we thank the Baltimore Streetcar Museum for giving us the shot to, to preserve 2168 and for museums like PTM that continue to work and partner with us to help preserve and support the trolley history of the greater Philadelphia area. And finally, as we wrap up uh, here at 61st in Baltimore, perhaps a, uh, a look into the future at some point with car 9000, if you check out the destination sign. Uh, something we hope happens and something the Friends Philadelphia Trolleys want to be part of one day. So with that, that wraps up our presentation. Uh, Kristen, we will turn it back over to you. Awesome. I just shared the link to Friends of Philadelphia Trolleys in the chat. So definitely go uh, click on that if you will. And I invite everybody to turn on their uh, videos now if you like. Um, I will allow you guys to unmute in just a second. But first of all, I want to thank Matt and Harry for tonight's presentation and thank all of you for coming tonight. Um, and this is our last trolleyology of the year. We got almost $700 in donations from this program alone. So thank you, thank you to everybody. Um, if you'd still like to make a year-end donation, you can visit patrolley.org slash support, which I also shared in the chat just a minute ago. Um, let me see. I'm going to let everybody unmute themselves. Um, Matt and Harry, I don't know if you guys noticed, but the chat was very active during your presentation today. So I think uh, maybe our in-person chat will be here too. Uh, and I think I have now allowed folks to unmute themselves. So um, feel free to do that. Uh, I think most people can find that in the bottom left of their Zoom controls. Thanks, Chris. I do apologize. We were attempting to uh, keep up with the chat, but we saw it was getting uh, pretty intense. So that was not through ignorance. Uh, it just got to the point we couldn't keep up with it anymore. So uh, for those that made comments, I promise Harry and I were not in ignoring you. Um, we were just trying to, uh, to keep up, so. Hey, Matt. Yes, hey, Ed. Uh, I just wanted to ask, and, well, first of all, thank you very much for the presentation. I enjoyed it very much. You had a lot of photos in there, which I have yet to see, especially the tight trolley loop, which was an elusive photo for me to see. Uh, at the same time, in your various sources, were you able to find the Juniper Street side that showed the ability of the rapid transit cars to loop? That is all. It, it shows up on those diagrams, which, by the way, I got through Charlie Long and a bunch of other people. Um, the I, I've never seen anything substantive that that actually was there. It, it, it's on the diagrams, and I, it shows up with more than one, so it must have been. 
but a picture is worth a thousand words and a lot of speculation. And uh, uh, where did you find the 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 uh, trolley loop photo, if I may ask? I, sure, sure. Uh, to answer your first question, no, I unfortunately we've not found uh, the photo you asked. Uh, the trolley loop photo, if I recall correctly, is from Joe Basha. Uh, the photo in the subway looking east from 19th Street, Ed Springer, uh, brought to our attention is from the Street Railway Journal. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. yeah, there are a couple early articles in there, and, and it's stuff very interesting to find. One last thing, and I don't want to hog this comment, but, and I couldn't tell uh, because some of your voices were muted. There was the conversation about relocating and putting the trolley underground through Penn campus. Was it ever mentioned that Penn has said, gee, we're going to move our campus because we don't want to have all the streetcars go through there? I did see an article either in one of the journals that said that Penn was willing to move or at least using that negotiating point. To hoping that they would get the streetcar someplace else and they put them underground, obviously, and Penn State where they are. Right. No, I did not mention that part. In fact, I do recall some years back, uh, I think it was a story in the Philadelphia Inquirer, one of the, the local historical societies talked about that Penn at, owned the property, which is now Chesterfield. Uh, oh, we lost your audio, Matt. Uh oh. How about now? Good. All right. Yeah, we're Harry and I sharing the mic. Unfortunately, was a, a last minute uh, uh, last minute change. We were trying to get Harry's computer working. But to answer the question, I didn't have it in there about the move of Penn or, or the the plan move. Penn owned the property, much of which is now Chesterbrook out near Valley Forge, with the intent of making that a campus. Uh, but that was part of the negotiating that uh, Penn used to against the city, to stay in the city. Again, there was an article some years back in the Inquirer or possibly in a local historical journal that talked about that. But we did not mention that piece. Great job, thank you. Sure. Matt? Hey, hey Matt. Oh, good. Go, Go ahead, ahead, Richard. Oh, okay. Thanks, guys. It was a terrific presentation. I recall from my uh, long ago misspent youth that uh, uh, after the uh, removal of the trolleys and, and actually before from Chestnut and Market Street, there had been a plan to route 42 also into the subway surface lines. Uh, any idea about that whole story and why it didn't happen? We didn't uncover anything about that. Um, there was a lot in the Bulletin Inquirer at the time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. In our research, we did not uncover that. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised, considering the thirteen, as we talked about, which was a surface route ended up in the subway later in 1956. But again, we did not uncover anything about the the 42. But uh, uh, as you said, I'm sure there are the resources like the Inquirer that that would mention that. Remember, at that time, 1956, 55, 56. PTC had just been taken over by National City Lines, right. which really wanted to get the streetcars off the streets. But I have heard that too, that they wanted to put the 42 in the subway. But 13 and 42 at the time, they had they had 124 cars just for those lines. So maybe they thought the subway would be too crowded for another heavy, heavy line. I don't know, but I, I have heard that story too, that uh, they wanted to put the 42 in the subway too. Because yeah, the tracks were left on 42 for almost a year after- That's right, that's uh, service, right. Uh, service ended. And uh, with the idea that, well, maybe they're, they're not gonna bring it back onto Chestnut and uh, Walnut Streets, which was a, a nightmare, but uh, into the subway surface would, would have worked. If I'm not mistaken, I had heard where even the city wanted to keep 42 as real. Yeah, uh, yeah, yes. yeah, that was yeah, very that, heavy line. Yeah, th th there were sort of counter forces at work. One was uh, Mayor Dilworth, who was very pro uh, uh, pro rail, and the other was National Cities, which owned yeah. everything. Because in that period, from 1955 to 1958, National City Lines 
uh, bust 31 car lines in a period of 33 months. Yep. 31 lines in a period of 33 months. Mm -hmm. They were, they really worked fast. Yeah. Thank you. I know uh, Red had a question. Go ahead. Me? Yeah, I think you. Oh, okay. You yeah, I'm sorry. Up? Yeah, I'm Rez. All right. First of all, good evening, Matt, Harry. How y'all doing? Good evening. Great side. Great, great presentations always. But two, a couple of things I wanted to bring. The one gentleman made a statement about the tunnel for the Market Frankfurt line going around City Hall. That's still present to this present day. If you actually ride the subway surface car coming to Juniper Street, look to your left. The tunnel is visible with the track. You can see it. Yeah. If anybody wants to see it, they can see it. It's visible mm -hmm. as day. Can't miss it. All right. Also, um, in reference with the um the subway surface cars on, on surface diversion, how do they manage to do that when they still had the um 21, the 17? And the 32 still running. That's and I understand it. How they managed to have five lines? Excuse me, we have five lines. 31 was going, and still run those three lines together. That would be interesting. Well, that's why they had a dispatcher there at City Hall. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. I was only a kid when that went on, but I heard about it from Ernie Moser. But uh, now the 21 on weekends. Uh, well. All right, I'm sorry, you're right. It didn't, it didn't come down the waterfront. They didn't come down the waterfront. So you only had 17 to 32. But uh, that's a good question. But uh, they had to keep those five surface lines, subway lines moving. But uh, that's why they had dispatchers down there. All right, cool. cool. And weekends, and weekend, Sunday weekend traffic wasn't as heavy as weekdays. Okay, okay. But they were able and to pull it off. Cool, cool, cool. And one more statement that we're not going to The 38 routing itself, this is for Matt, really. The 38 came down 33rd to a left one to Lancaster Avenue. It joined the 10 there, and then it went to Market Street. It didn't go straight to Market from 33rd. So, I mean, that it actually had a brief stint on Lancaster Avenue, and then it joined Market Street with the other um, three lines. That was it. Other than that, you guys great. There was a period of about 17 years when uh, Route 38 did go down 33rd to market. Well, when was that? From uh, from about 1930 to 1948, the okay. uh, track there was no track in the 3200 block of Lancaster. Oh, so the 10 did the same thing. That's correct. Oh, okay, cool. Uh, and as part of uh, subway construction, the uh, new track was laid on Lancaster Avenue. Oh, okay. Food for thought. Keep that in my, in my, in my reference way. Appreciate it. Thank you. Gee, everybody's learning stuff during these presentations. It's great. Uh, I see I'm, uh, someone with their hand up. Uh, letter. I'm sorry. According to Dr. Cox, that was 27th of September 36 to the 16th of December 47. Thanks. I'll post a link of the uh, new track being laid. Great. Uh, and uh, let, Mr. Letterer. Tom. Tom. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, going back to uh, Rich Allman's uh, discussion. Rich, I, I can't tell you where or when, but I did hear numerous times in the past that uh, PTC wanted to route more car more routes into the uh, routes into the subway but it was at capacity yeah. and they couldn't fit any more trolleys in there yeah. so i understand that's why some 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 routes that they were talking about putting into the subway at the end of the day they couldn't do it because there was too many cars going into the subway i, I don't know if that's if, if that is, is a fact uh, uh yeah i, Tom, I, I can't say it's just a fact. rationalization it's, yeah I can I can I can believe it because I was a frequent rider. Yeah. For the subway and uh, I can remember rush hour was a disaster. I used to yeah. work at Wanamaker's after school and uh, yeah. it was it was a it, it, I can remember them pushing people on the cars and then even changing uh, route numbers, you right. know, because they because they needed a thirty seven or a, or not a thirty seven but they needed a thirty six or a thirty four, and they would you know and I remember the guy. Uh, can't remember his name. I went to school with his daughter, but he was a supervisor. 
and he would change the route numbers and send the cars out on another route just to get the people out of the subway. It was, yeah. it, it was, it, it was like sardines. It's 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 plausible because yeah. you know it's it's yeah. the same thing in Boston. You know uh, uh, where they have multiple routes converging onto a single yeah. uh, a single trunk. In 1966 or 67, under PTC management, they brought in Clotter Associates to do a proposal to increase the number of cars in the subway by converting the all electrics into multiple unit. I have a copy of that proposal. Of course, it never went anywhere, but they did think if they coupled up and had two car trains of the all electrics that that would help give you more uh, volume in the subway, but it never came to pass. But there was somewhere in my collection, I have a copy of that uh, Plotter Associates proposal. Your, your problem, your problem would come in during the day, it would be fine, but you're probably come in with the trippers. When they put the trippers on uh, during rush hour, you'd have yeah, yep. like one yep. car after another with trippers. Yep. That's where I think the problem would lie. Oh, also real quick, um, um, the, the car that had the car that went into the actual subway was twenty three twenty eight because I was working at Elmwood when it happened. I was a controller. That's right. So twenty three twenty eight was the car. It wasn't twenty five twenty eight because I was the actual controller when it happened. <laughs> That's okay. like, oh, yeah. I'm like, but it was as you say, no harm, no foul. You know, once again, proven them wrong. You know, but they still won't let us take them in there though. I had the uh, I had the extreme play uh, adventure of uh, going into work on the, on the subway and uh, the, the motorman's foot came off the, uh, came off the yeah, deck and underneath okay. the Schuylkill River. And I never Ooh. seen a trolley stop so fast in all my life. He went up <laughs> against the windshield, knocked himself out. And finally, oh, when wow. we, got up, we got up to 22nd Street, they took him off in an ambulance. But it, it, oh, wow. <laughs> you're watching the poles go by and next thing you go, bing, stopped. <laughs> I'll tell any, you what's the scary uh, part. Go ahead. Oh, I was just gonna say, uh, any other questions for Harry and Matt or comment? I remember, I remember um, years ago, I took, I, I think I walked from the airport to the end of a line, and I think it wasn't there a proposal to extend the line to the airport, yes. which obviously yes, never happened. Yes, there yes, was. Chicago City. Yes, there was. Well, they were going to they were going to bring it into the airport. That was many years ago, but uh, that would have uh, been a very inefficient way to bring passengers from the yes. airport uh, into Center City. Uh, you know, schlepping them through the streets of West Philadelphia. Yeah, but another version, uh, once they got the airport high, high speed line planned, was to run the thirty six to Cargo City, uh, yeah. west end of the airport. Yeah. Yeah, not so useful for passengers, but it'd be useful for workers. It, it might well be useful for workers, correct. Yeah. That's, ain't nobody putting no suitcases on no trolley to no airport. I'll say that right now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Any other questions about the presentation or comments for Harry and Matt? Thanks, guys. Yeah. No, I'm great. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Awesome. Sure. <laughs> one, one last question, if I may. Uh, Can I Sorry. The track work adjacent to 30th Street Station for the surface routes, mm -hmm. didn't that have a couple configurations, like it was close to the terminal and then it had it yes. go yeah. down? The, yeah, yeah. Um, yes, it did, and uh, Ed Scooches' uh, contributed diagrams showed that. Oh, okay. That's right. That's right, because I know you didn't talk about it during the uh, presentation, but I just thought it was interesting. I guess basically because they couldn't run underneath the L or something that uh, the clearance changed. I know you, Matt, you had mentioned something about uh, how the the level of the street had come up so much. Right. And then uh, they started building the bulletin building and had to move the tracks again. Wow. Are, you talking about, okay. are you talking about the trolley apron? Where the cars came off of market and on into 30th Street before going over the river? Yes. All right. To on my understanding, sides. on both sides, they did move the cars to the north side of Market Street to allow the subway construction in 1953. 
And then with Mr. Harry, what you're referring to is when they built the Bozen Building, which was a whole block at 31st Street, they had originally came to there, they rerouted it over to Market Street. And then when they did the construction in 1953, they shipped the car from under the L to the north side of Market Street, and then a short apron to in front of the south side of 30th Street Station. That yeah, was that, um Yeah, that's the I think that's the couple changes in there. I know it was just briefly mentioned, but I thought it was interesting that they had it do all that back and forth in there. Uh -huh. Anyway, guys, thank you so much. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays. <laughs> one, yes, one, one quick question. Does anybody have, we had a, a rough time finding, I found one picture of a near side on Route 38. Near sides on the subway surface lines, just can't find any photos. If anybody has any, would you share them with us? Yes. Uh, we couldn't find, we only found one, that one on Route 38, and it was, before the center doors were put in, but uh, and, Harry, I think so in Cox, back in night in the night a hundred and some years ago, people weren't walking around with cell phone cameras, so they're very very rare. If you look, if on you Cox's, do, if you look, oh, on sorry, Cox's go ahead, book, Ray. If you look on Cox's book, it shows you the early entrance of the subway, and that's you'll see the back of a nearside car going in the subway. You'll see one there. If anyone does have one, feel free to, uh, you can email me and I'll get you in touch with Matt and Harry. Um, my email is in the uh, confirmation email that you got this evening. Uh, all right. So I think we're going to wrap it up there. Thank you again, Matt and Harry. This was awesome. Uh, I think uh, I learned a lot and I hope all of you guys did too. And um, like uh, Richard said, I want to wish everybody a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays because we won't see each other again until 2023. Thank you again to those of you who donated during your registration for tonight's program. Um, as Catherine Black said, I think this was an excellent way to finish the year and you guys are always invited back for your next program. I hope you're already working on it. <laughs> One more question. Uh, oh, two, okay. One more question. Two gentlemen made a fantastic presentation. I hope that you could write a book, however small. I'm serious, so that this is preserved. This is not preserved in the same sense. Uh, it's, it's not published. I hope you could do something like that. And perhaps CERA, which seems to publish anything, uh, any topic, I mean, uh, might be interested. But please do that. Thank you. Fair enough. Thank you, Alan. I, I appreciate you mentioning that. Um, I'll keep in mind. I, I did promise that Sandra loves this Wait, stuff. Matt, we can't hear you. Oh, boy. There goes the mic again. How about now? There, <laughs> yeah. there we go. At least the mic made it most of the way. Um, Alan, thank you. Appreciate the comments. Um, certainly, it's something we can consider. I, uh, I have a son who really loves this stuff, who collects materials. The only thing that could hamper that is I promised him we would co-author a book one day on trolleys of Hanover, Pennsylvania, which was, we did a trolleyology as part of a precursor to putting that together, but I appreciate the comment, Alan, and, and understand your point about preservation. Uh, it dies when they, when it dies, when the, when the potential author dies, it's basically the knowledge. If you don't put it in print, it's not going to be there. There'll be new technologies. You won't be able to use, uh, computer of Zoom in the future, no doubt. Um, it's gone. But a book, well, they've been books for thousands of years. So please. That, that, that's a good point. Um, and uh, we're doing what we can here at the Pennsylvania Trolley Museum to record these stories and presentations, uh, however short they are. Um, and this one, again, will be posted to our YouTube sometime in 2023. And um, again, if you have an idea for a future presentation, please reach out to me. My email is in your confirmation email that you got tonight. Again, uh, thanks to Matt and Harry, everybody for joining us. Uh, Merry Christmas, happy holidays, and almost happy new year. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night, everybody. Bye. Thank you.